Hi everyone and welcome to this latest tutorial where we're going to take a look at the new viral clusters on packet.net service. So this is a multi-node viral server operating on the packet.net platform giving you unprecedented size and scale. If you haven't already used the viral on packet service please do take a look at the tutorial videos available on YouTube that cover the installation of the systems and their operation as well. The URLs are shown here and will also be linked to the page on YouTube. In order to use the viral cluster service, you'll need to be an existing viral user. You must either have a local viral server or have got the viral box cutter launcher VM installed. You must have a valid viral license key and have also established an account on packet.net and obtained your API key. So let's take a look at the mechanics. So on your server, you're going to run the terraform command again, or if you're using the box cutter, you're going to run these commands. Once you're installed and running, the system's going to reach out to the packet.net API gateway and request the setup of not one, but however many servers you've requested. So in this example, one controller and three compute nodes. Once those servers are provisioned, the software is then being installed onto the controller node. It's configured to run as a cluster rather than as a single node, but all the rest of the operation, such as the client, OpenVPN, and SSH functionality works exactly as normal with your access to the controller. So your OpenVPN tunnel connecting to the controller. Same thing when we're terminating. It's then gonna tear down the system and bring you back to zero. But what's different and specific about operating with a cluster is that we're now running with not just one server, but multiple servers with our virtual machines distributed across the servers all operating within one control environment, one cluster. So the obvious question is, why would you want to use clusters? Well, each of the servers has a capacity limit. If you're using the bare metal type 1, you know, it's a 32 gig system. If you're using the bare metal type 3, it's a 128 gig system. There's still a limited number of CPU cores. Depending on the type of virtual machine that you're running or the number of virtual machines, of a particular type that you're running. You may need more compute capacity than you have on the single system. So for example, our biggest, uh, most CPU hungry and memory hungry uh, virtual machine image is iOS XRV 9000. It needs 16 gigs per instance and four CPU cores. You could only get one to two of those instances on a single bare metal type one server, yet with clusters we can run many of these things. So let's take that as an example. Let's see what happens when we try and run multiple of these in a cluster configuration. So I've logged into my viral server. First of all, we install salt. And then because I'm on my viral server, sudo salt-call-ldbug state.sls viral.terraform. And even if I've run it before, I'm going to run it again just to make sure I've got all the latest stuff. So that's completed now. And now we see there's a directory, viral cluster. So we're going to take a look in there. So we've got a number of files, very similar to what you may have seen before. Just highlight a few. There's a copy of the readme file and also the disclaimer. Worth taking a quick look through that. But the first one we're going to take a look at is our passwords file. So these passwords are automatically generated, but you can edit them if you require. Next one is our settings file. And here we can see um, the bare metal type is set to type one. You can change it to type three, of course. And the dead man's timer again set to four. Not going to go too much into the dead man's timer. Please refer back to the previous videos which have covered this in some length. Now I need to paste my packet.net API key value into that field. Paste that in there. So that has to be in place before we go any further. And that's now saved. Now let's take a look at cluster configuration options. So we have a series of viral x node.tf.orig files. Our default is viral2 node. So that's one controller, one compute. If I want to change that, just delete viral 2 node.tf and replace that with, in this case, I want 4 node.tf. So that gives me one controller and three computes. One more step. We now need to edit dot slash conf slash viral.ini. This is the configuration file that tells the system it's now running in cluster mode 
with one controller and n many computes. So depending on which of the TF files we're selecting to use, we need to adjust the viral INI accordingly. So I'm now editing my INI file and I'm looking for the section that says compute two. So we can see compute one is set to true. And because I'm adding two more computes, I need to change that from false to true for compute two and also for compute three. We're leaving compute four alone because this is only set up for one controller and three computes. So we leave that one alone. We're going to now save that file. So we're all set. We can now issue the command terraform plan dot. That's going to validate our file. And if we take a quick look through that, we can see there's compute one, compute two, and compute three all being set. And then there's also our viral. That's our controller instance. Next, we're going to use the command terraform apply dot, and that's going to start up our cluster configuration. And now we just sit back and wait for the system to come up. So when provisioning completes and successful, we see an output like this with a whole series of details there. Uh, note that as normal, we're using OpenVPN to provide a secure access mechanism. So we want to grab the content of our OpenVPN file. So there it is, cluster.openvpn. And I can literally just copy that, paste that into a text file, and pass that, in this case, to my uh, TunnelBlick client. So just copying that. And I'm going to pop that into a text file. There we go. Save that. And ready for use with TunnelBlick. So next I want to log into my server, so there's the IP address, let's just ping that, there it is, it's up and running, it's good. And we're going to SSH into that device and take a quick look around. So all the normal OpenStack commands are there, but there are a few differences in the output. So here we can see not just one host, but there are a series of others. There's the Compute1, Compute2, and Compute3 hosts being listed there. Also, the neutron agent list output is slightly different. Again, we can see compute one, compute two, compute three, and our controller node there. And that output is normal. Not all of the agents are running on all of the servers. And the hypervisor now shows four entries, four locations where virtual machines can actually be running. Now, I've started up my OpenVPN connection, and I'm logging in because I actually want to pick up uh, a new virtual machine image that's going to really you know, utilize the cluster that I've built here. So logging in as normal. And now I actually want to go into the viral software page and pick up the iOS XRV 9000 virtual machine. So under viral software, scroll down, and there it is, XRV 9000. So I'm going to select that and let that install. So that's installed. And now in Maestro, I just need to update my subtypes to take advantage of the new type. So from Preferences, Node Subtypes, and we're going to Fetch from Server. That's now showing me the available subtypes, including the XRV9000. I want that in my palette, so turn that to True and Apply. There's the new icon. So I'm opening up a file that I've designed earlier, and here's my topology. So I'm going to configure that. There we go. And let's just run auto netkit so we can get a view of it. And here's our topology with some BGP and some eBGP. Let's take a quick look at that. Yep, all looking good. Okay, so we're happy and ready to launch. So let's flip back to Maestro and fire it up. So the behavior is exactly the same in terms of the operations, um, except that now because we're running on a cluster configuration, that set of eight iOS XRV 9000s is now being distributed across the compute nodes. So here we are, we've jumped forward a bit, our nodes are all up and running, and let's take a look at the back end. So we've logged into UWM, I'm just refreshing, and here we'll see in a moment, 
system status view is different than what we've seen before because now we're looking across the controller and the three compute nodes. So we can see the load there. And if we take a look at the node, we, the VM control under nodes, here we can see the distribution nodes being spread across all of the various devices that we have in our cluster. And we can see which ones are actually placed where. Network view is the same as we've seen before. There are some new entries just to do with the cluster networking. Just expand that view a bit. Okay, so we're going to go back up to the top level and then click into the simulation that's actually running there. Now there are a couple of things here which are worth pointing out. So you'll notice on the external connections, not all of the nodes there are filling with that Telnet entry. Now the reason behind that is because those two nodes that we can see listed there, those are running directly on the controller to which I'm logged in. The other nodes are distributed across the other compute nodes. So we can't directly Telnet into the serial ports associated with them. So this is normal and expected. Okay, so we actually have to use a different mechanism, which is telnetting into a web socket in order to connect to those devices. So we can see, again, you know, the nodes, the distribution, which are actually sitting on the controller. So there they are, five and six, and that maps to those telnet ports that we're seeing, whereas all the others are distributed across the various compute nodes that we have. So for these, they don't have direct uh, console port access. Instead, we can use the web socket to console port mechanism in order to get in. Now we can see that the virtual machines are booted. We can see the RAM usage has increased um, as the, the operating system has expanded into memory and it's all up and functional now. So now I want to log into an IMA node. So I'm picking up the web socket console connection. So there it is, C0. And that's now opening up in my web browser and giving me a console port connection bounced through the controller node onto the compute node where that virtual machine is now running. So log in as normal. And if we take a look at the show version, we can see it's a 600 release of XRV9000. And just check the routing table. So obviously this is iOS XR config. So here we've got some OSPF routes that are present in the table. Just see where we sit with the BGP sessions. Yep, and those are still coming up. Some of the prefixes are still there, it's starting to get loaded. So flipping back to VM Maestro, again, now some of these devices, so this device is running on that controller node. So all of these ports, the direct telnet ports, are populated. So if I take another node though, so this is actually running off on a different compute node, we only see one port. However, if we go down to the telnet over WebSocket, there's my access mechanism. So now I'm again doing that bump through the controller node onto the compute node where the device is running. And again, I'm able to log directly into the console. And again, just interact with the device as normal. So the key things to remember here is that the access mechanisms are slightly different because we've got this distribution of virtual machines now running across both the, uh, all of the various devices, all the various servers that we have within our cluster. So here we can see you know, BGP is up and running, so we've got communication established between all the various virtual machines distributed across those compute servers um, and the controller node that is sitting within the cluster. So I'm going back to my viral server where I started my simulation and I want to terminate everything. So the command terraform destroy dot in the directory where I launched from and there we see the state messages, the destroy messages confirming that the packet API gateway is bringing those servers down. But it's always a good idea to confirm that that uh, termination has happened correctly. So log into the packet uh, gateway, log into my account, and we want to check within the project to make sure that the servers have indeed been terminated. And there we see no servers, so we have successfully terminated and we're ready to start over.